where can the field go from here, right? Not just Civil War history, African American history, because obviously, you know, gender history, like we're talking about so many different subfields that are all in conversation, and they always need to be in conversation. Um, so I want to at least, you know, take a second and reflect on you calling these family members living monuments, to me is really profound, and forces, I hope, others to have conversations going forward about reconsidering, you know, when they talk about the UDC and this, that there were people, not just the veterans, families that were living monuments of the long-term ramifications and memory of the war. So I realized that was, let me flip that. Like, where do y'all like in different ways believe that, you know, graduate students, you know, early career, but also even you know, those who are thinking of maybe a new project, where can they go? I will add to um, one of it is recognizing where these archives are because we know we just have to be upfront. Our field was complicit <laughs> in spreading the lost cause. Like I can't, like we can't get around it. So that is a recognition of there. But every community I've lived in, I always get stopped by a black family and like, let me tell you about my civil war. So we need to start listening to those voices and listening to communities who are looking to us and expecting us, especially after this January 6th moment. And they're de making demands and we have to listen. So where do we put those porches in? Where do we put that vernacular and actually listen, take those archives with the other problematic archives? So we need more books about African-American memory and something that I always push you, you can't just focus on Black New York, Black Philadelphia, and the big city. Cumberland Valley, Pennsylvania, the Harrisburgs, the, <laughs> the Fulton counties, the, all those rural counties that have GAR African American units that get created, that their children are still there and they are holding this memory going forward. They are also the teachers, they're the Sunday school teachers, they are the ones writing those columns in the 1950s. You can talk about community long term, but we have to take it serious that there was more than black memory than those cities. Right. And then the other is, and this is a sustainable plug. Like I have yet, like my dad's side of the family, Gullah Sea Islands, he's covered. Sure. <laughs> I have still yet to see other than um, Ed Ayers' book, three um, books about Franklin County, Pennsylvania, covered. Um, and there's some other works I have tried, but every time he, his book comes out and I give it to my mother and I give it to my aunts and my great aunts who still live in Franklin County, mm. they're like, wow, we got the Civil War, but we're still here. What happened to, like, we're not in the books. We're still here though. Right. And mm. so to think about the post-war and the post-war rural North, and the rural North in general. And I think Kelly's work does this with Ohio, but we need to really tease out these small rural communities that are there and haven't reached the gaze of scholars. And that means actually having to go to the archives. And if you go to Franklin County Archives at the Franklin County Historical Society in Chambersburg, their newspapers are in the old jail cell. There's no AC on that third floor. It means digging through. <laughs> down ledgers of old newspapers and getting dirty to tell these stories. So we're gonna to have to invest in the communities that we say we are invested in and speak to these questions, but we need really more breadth <laughs> and variety and not just the cities. The local stories are really important and there are a couple um, and they're, they're being done outside of um, you know the traditional uh, Civil War scholarship in the academy, and so a couple of them I can think of is Hinsonville's uh, Heroes, and that's Hanchester County, Pennsylvania, by um, Cheryl Gooch, and then uh, Ethel Washington did Union County's Black Soldiers and Sailors in New Jersey. We need more of these, and we need North, Midwest, border yes. states. Yes. Even um, I know there's some there there are multiple works on Kentucky, but there's so much more to do. Uh, starting to get some more on Tennessee, but there's so much more to do. Um, yeah, th that's where I think we can get that community, family, and then place it in the larger um, narrative. Uh, I, I also think, and no, sorry, it's just what I do. Uh, we need some recruitment work done. And how that affects Black families, again, whether free or enslaved, 
or formerly enslaved that are then crossing the Ohio River and, and going into Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. And, and, and recruitment uh, of, of black soldiers is just so diverse depending on where you're at and what point of the war. Uh, there's not one story that needs to be flushed out, but it's how it affects the families and um, where one son may join uh, and then a second son is drafted. We're not talking about the draft and the impact that has uh, Northern and Midwestern black families. They, these are uh, individuals who may uh, have considered joining, but decided to best protect their families at home, or maybe they're against, maybe they don't believe they should give their life for a country that doesn't recognize them, which is right. a very common refrain throughout the North and Midwest right. in, in African American communities and churches. And so what impact does that have on the family when they are either forcibly a place in the military, or they have a 16 year old son who decides that they're going to join and who will help them. And, and so there, there's, there are just topics that maybe we think about are covered, but they're not. And again, they all come back to the family. They come back to how that has an impact. Does mom and dad get an audience with the local provost marshal to get their son back or not? Well, I agree a hundred percent Hillary with not just bringing more communities in, but actually doing history that's really engaged with those communities today. And um, I learned this with my book when I found that in some of these places I was studying, it was the local historians, the descendants, the people living there today that were out in front of the scholars on digging up this history and uh, really understanding the significance of it. And so I think that as we think geographically, as we've been talking about and think about place, we have to, as scholars, also, um, you know, recognize that it all doesn't begin with us. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that there are many people today to learn from um, in these communities. So I wanted to, to add on that. And um, as far as where I'd like to see things going in the future, I am a social historian, so I'm always going to think about things in terms of social history. I think there's so much about the everydayness of war um, that we still need to dig out, whether it's of those who fled, those who enlisted, those who were on plantations, those who remained in some of these northern communities. Just understanding sort of the, the texture of their lives. There's so much more. Um, to dig out. And um, I think I'd like to see in terms of method, I'm really curious about digital history. I mean, it's something I've worked with going back to graduate school, but I'm, I think there's a lot more potential here for um, doing family history in a digital environment and mapping movements maybe in the way that, you know, Hillary was talking about or family networks and um, so forth. So I think the, the last scene project at Villanova that Judy Giesberg has overseen, it's fantastic in um, digitizing all of those information wanted ads. So, you know, there's an example, I guess a personal plug, and this gets to one of Kelly's points. I think you said something about Kentucky. There's, you know, not enough about Kentucky. Well, we are launching a digital project right now. I'm working with my students about soldiers who, and their families who went to Camp Nelson and enlisted and, and lived. And what we're doing is mapping their movements out of slavery through the war and beyond to sort of get a sense of getting back to migration and getting a sense of um, how their lives played out across space. So, but that's a little ways down the road. <laughs> and a lot of Kentuckians were in the um, regiments who the war ends, right? And you have a significant number of, of black men remaining because their three-year terms are not. Then you also have this shift uh, to the Texas-Mexico border. And there's a lot of black Kentuckians there and mm -hmm. their um, displeasure, and, you know, and how, again, their families, what's happening. And then also too, you could be like my Civil War ancestor who I talked about in the book, who's in a uh, Fortress Monroe for ball and chain around his foot because he was trying to protect another <laughs> member from getting kicked off. Those who resist yeah, and fight yeah. back and end up in the prisons and then they come home 
and then the November 1865 Harrisburg Review and this celebration, but he doesn't get to join that because he's literally somewhere else. So those people who don't make it home directly and don't have the stellar Civil War histories, even that messiness, I want more of the realness. I don't want the perfect soldier. I want the soldier who gets into trouble. Yes. Yeah, I mean, those are really important and complicate as I learned. Like what I thought, you know, I thought I was getting gonna tell the glory story. And it turned out it's actually really messy. I think, you know, you all touch on some really important points. For me, it's, I was trained by, you know, an eminent gender historian. So everything I do is gonna have that analysis to it. And doing that allows me and I hope others to start to reconsider things like desertion. You know, we previously talked about not being paid um, and writing home to their families. Was even when I'm teaching my students, I'm trying to explain to them that men, black men are saying that they feel that they are, their manhood is cheapened, literally, and the consequences it has on their idealized notion as the breadwinner, right? But what does that mean for a black child who takes up the slack and becomes the breadwinner for that family, right? So I think it's important to really tease out, you know, these questions for topics we already study, or in some cases overstudy, and and really understand and not say someone was a coward because they deserted. Well, they felt that their manhood was cheapened, literally. Um, and they see it also as a rate, you know, even black military disobedience has connections to, you know, obviously Joseph Clotar and many others have talked about this, right? Like the, the racial tensions, but there's a gendered tension as well. You know, I think of Lorian Foote, uh, Keith, uh, Keith B. Wilson, like all these other scholars who have done this and adding that conversation. And I, I guess my push is for grad students to make sure, even if you're doing tactical, you know, history, even if you're doing, you know, military social history, there's always a way to incorporate the understanding of gender to all of it. Uh, for me, I also- I jump in real quick? Oh, yes, because you brought it up and Hillary's brought it up and it's related. So children- Yes. Uh, that's- that's not an overstudied subject. Yes. <laughs> That's another yes. key one. So I just want to put that out there for anybody listening. Much more to say and do about children. Yes, James Martin and has- Generation of children. You were talking generational terms. Yeah. And yeah. also too, I want to give a plug for Kelly's advisor. We need more veterans and we need Kelly's work in veteran lives. Yes. And especially veterans in the color conventions, like veterans who are in politics and reconstruction era politics. Those who are literally using Civil War memory and the memories of the war to enact political change across all levels. So that means not just the big name people right. like the Robert Smalls, that means city, county, <laughs> like what are those networks and especially those tied to college campuses, mm. those tied to other things, where is that coming in? And also HBCU founders. Mm -hmm. Where is that in there? So I think we can do a lot more on the veteran side right. if we really branch out. And another way, too, that generation over time and how they impact families for themselves, but also their communities. Yeah, I mean, to cut back to Amy's point, like I know James Martin has done a lot of work on, on the family uh, structure, but there needs to be more on the Black family. Freed and freeborn experiences in different regions, right? Like, for example, Hillary's work, Kelly's work, Amy's work is all going to look at the, the child experience in a very different way, especially if you go generational. And I'm trying to, you know, make sure that that's something I recognize in the work I do. It's because it doesn't just affect husbands and wives, it, can, it affects the children. I think also it's worth at least throwing it out there for, I've made this call on social media. In the records, in the regimental books, I've noticed a number of USCT soldiers um, we're born outside of the United States, and we need to go, if we're going to do that conversation, go beyond Canada, right? Like that work has been done and will continue to be done because it's important. But I can tell you right now in the third, the sixth, and the eighth USCI, and also in the 20th, 26th, and 31st, which is from New York State, there are Black men born in Jamaica, Peru, Cuba, Germany, like they're from all over. So adding in that experience, because my first question is, why are you coming here? Do you know what you're doing? You, that like, I want to know. And the fascinating part is a number of these soldiers and the ones I've looked at desert. So it brings to questions, what did they already go? What did I just get myself involved in? Like I, this, the idea and the reality of service don't match up. But I think this is, we, the scholarship has 
largely kind of just acted like this was an a, a Afro or Afro Canadian and, and an African American experience, and it was not. And we have to add that conversation, and that would be a phenomenal book that someone should do. But and I'm telling you, they are in the records, and they're in the compiled military service records and the regimental books. They're there. And I'm thinking about Amy. You mentioned um, Alice Baumgartner's book about South of Freedom. Yes. What are those in Mexico and the yes. people point out who are influencing? Right. From Mexico, <laughs> the 1850s, and think about that. How mm -hmm. many of them enlisted? Mm -hmm. And if they're able to go there, and I'm thinking about movements and waterways and pathways and how people obtain and how they could involved in the war and just travel to the war. Right. Now, what strikes me, a lot of my Pennsylvanians and people, they're taking the train to Philly to train. Oops. How many of that started with a train? <laughs> how many, and it ended with a train. So <laughs> what does that mean? And the fact that they're going out of their communities for the first time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, and I would just add with the migration, another call that could be made is from my experiences of those who were freed, they were more likely to travel post-war um, for things like employment, familial reconnection. And I say that because at least one soldier who serves um, in, in a New York regiment, he actually goes from tennis, or I believe it was Tennessee to Australia for about five years to be a sheep herder. What? <laughs> and it's just like, and there's those kind of questions, but for a lot of the, the Northern urban African-Americans, they come right back home, right? And they're, and they're living in the same general communities that they were raised in. So the likelihood for that, I don't want to say, well, also wanderlust, right? That, that now all of a sudden they have the ability to go without, you know, supervision, without needing, a, you know, an order or permission, that's more likely to happen for those who were formerly enslaved. So even just using migration, post-war as a way to talk about what does freedom mean for those who served in a different way than those who were more likely to be stationary for whatever reason, right? Whether that's responsibilities to family, disability, right? Like uh, occupational, educational connections, what have you. Um, yeah, this is really great. I mean, trust me, I have so many more questions, but I don't want to take up my esteemed um, colleagues time. I just want to thank each of you for this. This has been engaging. I have so many notes and so many book ideas that I probably will never see the light of day. <laughs> but um, just again, thank you very much. And I hope the audience enjoyed this as much as we did. Thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed it.